Welcome everybody to the September 10th edition of the Food Leader Series. Tonight we'll be talking about going back to the land and family farming. Uh, very excited about what we have in store for us tonight. And make sure I switch to the right presentation. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jason Matthias. I'm a husband and father of five. I've been gardening my whole life, so this is a big passion of mine. Uh, recently started some uh, small-scale farming as well, so excited about tonight's show. Um, I'm an Air Force veteran and entrepreneur and uh, the founder of True Food Solutions, which you, if you haven't already become a member, uh, we are basically a community online of uh, all types of people interested in, in different aspects of food, whether you're a gardener yourself, uh, or you're starting farming, or you've been farming your whole life. Uh, if you're just a foodie, or maybe a food activist, you like local food, and uh, want to learn how to um, branch out in your skills and your knowledge, that's a place to share uh, what you're doing, what you've learned, and um, ask questions of other people. And uh, together, hopefully, uh, each of us can learn faster and implement uh, locally where we're at things that people are doing uh, elsewhere. We want to grow ideas together and that is the purpose of the, um, of the website. Tonight, uh, our leader is Noah Sanders. Uh, he is a farmer. He manages uh, Aurora Valley Farms in Alabama, and uh, he oversees production of vegetables, uh, free-range egg layers, uh, pastured poultry for meat, as well as fruit. Uh, he is a blogger at uh, redeemingthedirt.com, and uh, his book, uh, Born Again Dirt, was recently released. Earlier this year, he was actually one of the featured speakers at the food conference in San Antonio back in July, uh, where I've met uh, a number of people that are joining us here tonight. A little bit about the book. Um, really, it's uh, an encouragement to Christian farmers to use uh, the scriptures as a guide to how to evaluate farming methods. Uh, he looks at uh, various principles throughout the Bible related to agriculture and provides application of those. Uh, and some of the topics include how we design our farms as uh, fruitful homes, uh, honoring God's design in creation for farm production, growing crops that honor God, um, using marketing as a ministry, uh, which is a rather unique concept that Noah has developed. I'm talking about the idolatry of modern agriculture and, and why that is, uh, is what it is and why it's important. And then talking about the advantages of the farming lifestyle and how to start a farm and make a living. And those are some of the, the things that he has particularly uh, prescient practical experience with that he'll be sharing some with uh, us tonight. So without further ado, uh, Noah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. How are you? Good. Thanks, Jason. Go ahead, Noah. Go ahead and uh, start your presentation. All right. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Noah Sanders calling here from uh, Alabama. It's uh, been nice and cool here lately. And um, tonight I'm just going to share a little bit about uh, how I got started in farming. Um, just, I'm really just a beginning farmer. This is our fourth full-time year. Um, and just continue to try to learn. And uh, But wanted to share just... Uh, some of my story and what I've learned so far for um, for the encouragement of y'all. So uh, since I, I've been, I was homeschooled um, for all my education and loved work with my hands and did lots of projects um, with my schooling. We had a small um, garden, which is a picture in the prior slide here, um, when I was growing up and was interested in having my own business. My father had kind of given me a vision for that and was talking to a dad who talked about how he was growing some of his own food. And it was, I guess, intriguing to me the idea of actually trying to grow your own food, not just have a garden as a hobby. And so I took over our family's garden. It was all kind of grown up in weeds at that point and, and really enjoyed um, growing things and had kind of some success and was kind of interested in pursuing that as, as a possible business that I could use, do uh, with my family. I enjoyed the, the variety of the work and working with my hands. But my father grew up in Indiana, 
um, around big scale agriculture and kind of grew up thinking that if you didn't, um, if you weren't born, you know, and if you didn't inherit a large farm or weren't willing to go into a bunch of debt, then it, you know, it was really impossible to make a living farming. But, uh, my, as, as God would have it in his providence, I was lent a book, um, Joel Salatin's You Can Farm in 2005. <laughs> and, read that, shared it kind of with my dad, and we kind of got the vision for um, Joel Salton. What he presents in there is kind of a smaller, small-scale retail-type farming model that contrasted the, the large-scale wholesale model that my dad was used to. And so we decided this might be possible. So I began to, on a small scale, do some patch of poultry and did some bees, learned from a beekeeper, um, increased our garden, um, went to uh, Joel Salden's farm, Polyface, which is the next slide. Um, in 2005, we visited there. We got to see his place. Um, was really inspired by all the, the different enterprises we saw going on there. And uh, we had 11 acres at this time right outside of town. And so we started off with some meat chickens that we were raising and selling and, and had for ourselves. And then we had some egg layers, a small flock for ourselves primarily, <coughs> and some uh, garden. Yeah, here we go. So we just were trying to be faithful with a little. Um, instead of before we went went large scale, uh, I was still finishing up high school this time. So we had was experimenting with different types of gardening methods. You know, no-till, mulch, or um, bed, raised bed versus rows, <coughs> and um, kind of developed what we wanted to start with, which was the egg layers, the broilers, and the garden. So my father kind of had a vision for wanting to have a, uh, a kind of a family home place, a farm where we could, where the rest of my siblings, I'm, I'm the oldest of eight siblings, and where we could kind of have a family home place. So we ended up buying 100 acres and began developing it um, while we still lived at our other place. Um, it was mostly woods. No, it's part of me. I have a little bit of a sore throat and a cough, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, we had to basically start from scratch. So let's, let's go to the next slide here. Um, had, a, had a pond built, um, had some areas cleared for pasture. Um, this is a picture of a shop that we built. It's the first building on the farm. And... Um, kind of spent a couple of years. When I finished high school, the last thing I did was develop a business plan uh, for my farm. My dad had me do that as an assignment, and um, we we started the farm not as, as mine, but as a, uh, as a family farm, and I'm the manager of the farm, because it's very difficult to have <coughs> too many separate businesses on, on a piece of shared property, because you just get into... Um, how to actually organize that. So we just decided to have it a family-owned farm, and then I worked as the manager. Um, so I did marketing research and all, and, and the first year we were going to start, we had to, my dad felt like he needed to wait until he sold where we lived before, uh, before we built a house up at the new farm. And providentially, the Lord just sold it at one of the worst times, but uh, just an amazing situation very quick. And we ended up moving up to that barn, the shop that we built. <coughs> it was a really fun time for our family. We were all crammed in there. Um, we had about 500 square feet that was finished, and then what you see in the picture is kind of the open part of the shop or the pole barn. It had concrete. We had tents out there where we kids slept in for rooms and um, had had a great time. That We started the farm that year and uh, washed lettuce in, that, in kind of our makeshift kitchen and uh, had all those refrigerators behind the table there that you see for our eggs. Um, it, it was it was real neat to see how the Lord provided markets for us. I had those refrigerators there, and for a month before the rest of the family moved up, I had to move up to the farm to take care of the uh, several hundred chickens that we had there. And uh, I remember when those refrigerators would fill up, and I didn't have any more uh, space for eggs. I just loaded them up in the car and drove and 
uh, was able to, to bless people with them. And we quickly went from having too many eggs to uh, to sell to um, not enough and uh, more demand. So it was neat. The, the markets, we were very blessed with markets here. Um, and the, the Lord just really blessed that first year. Let's see. Let's go on to the next slide here. We had a uh, one acre of a bottom land that we had cleared for a garden. Uh, that's that there. We had <coughs> grew a lot of lettuces and greens and squash that year. Um, and it was kind of hard because I had planned out the whole the whole garden, you know, like we uh, is wise to do and try to figure out what all my planting successions were and everything. And then ended up the uh, the whole about half the garden flooded that year and was very very boggy and I couldn't even get into it. Um, so kind of had to throw that plant out the window and just um, plant wherever I could, whenever I could that first year. And uh, but but we had again some some really good success from the land there, and we just enjoyed doing it as a family. We had chefs coming out and and getting stuff and trying to support us as we were getting going, and uh, it was just it was a learning time, but a great great time that first year growing food. Um, go on, go on to the next slide. We also didn't have as many weeds that first year. <laughs> definitely come on later. We sold, we were blessed with a nice <coughs> farmer's market in a, a large city about an hour from here. We took a lot of our stuff to, we were able to build a lot of relationships with people. <coughs> Up in the uh, top right hand corner of that slide you can see where our eggs have them in some uh, local family owned grocery store type markets. Uh, we were became kind of well known that year for our eggs that we sell and uh, it's, it's ever this is our fourth year going um, and it's just like a family reunion every time we go back um, in the spring seeing all the customers and uh, all the other vendors that we enjoy seeing and the, the, the market's just been a real blessing in terms of the relationships we've been able to build and relationships have been a big part of our marketing so that next year um, after we began the farm and we, we had some success. Um, I was, ended up getting married in the next spring, um, my wonderful wife Dorothy, and, uh, and then last year we had our, uh, our first son Enoch and he just turned one uh, about a week and a half ago and uh, you see him there. We got all our bags, baskets of eggs behind him on the floor. And uh, we've been able to work. My wife is, uh, I'm blessed. She loves plants, loves gardening, loves uh, the farm lifestyle. And that's that's a really big key in being able to farm successfully as a family is, is having the support of people involved. And uh, it's, it, I've definitely had the support of my wife. And we have a blast together with all the things that we do. We uh we're able to work together, play together, rest together, and, and uh, it's just it's such a blessing to be able to be home and, and eat most of our meals together and um, take take Enoch out with me when I work some. He's not quite walking yet, so once he gets walking, he can't just, I don't want to crawl him down on the ground around the animals, but once he can walk and stand there while I'm working the garden, hopefully I can, I can take him out more. We can go to the next slide there. I need to have them up here for me. I, I can't remember which one comes next here. There we go. Okay, we'll talk about our farm today. Um, four years later here, we our, our core enterprises are still the uh, the meat chickens and the broiler, the egg layers and the vegetables. That's our pond there. My brother Ethan sitting on the dam. That's our tree house in the middle of the pond. Uh, my dad had a great idea of one of the big trees that were in the middle. When we had the pond built, we actually built a tree house on there, so that's one of the recreational things we do. These are our laying hens. Uh, we have them in our uh, electric netting, kind of salatin style that we move around the farm. 
Um, we have a couple geese in there with the chickens that uh, protect them from the hawks. And there we have some buff warpingtons and some black, black ostrilorps. And have a swimming pool in there for the geese. And at this point, they were kind of in a young orchard that we have there that we were kind of having them clean up for us. Um, we've been able to use them to, for a lot of bug cleanup and uh, fertilizing around the farm, trying to utilize relationships with, uh, with the different aspects of our farm, not just view them as individual uh, entities on the farm that don't really have any um, impact on each other, but try to figure out what how we can utilize all the different resources, how different things can benefit each other, how the animals can benefit the land and animals can benefit each other, feed the, uh, the leftover milk from the cow to the um, to the pigs and uh, have the fertilizer from the chicken to go to the, to the garden. Go ahead and go to the next slide there. We use guard dogs to protect our chickens from the many predators we have. We have hawks and coyotes and raccoons and possums and um, just all sorts of crit critters that are after the chickens. So this is our great Pyrenees dog, Bella. We have staked out with some of the chickens and in the garden that we've got, she does a good job of keeping away the, uh, the predators. She's real sweet, too. Go to the next slide. Here, we use the chickens in the garden. I actually have one flock that is been in the garden for over a year now, just permanently. I rotate it around from spot to spot. The chickens take all the, the crabgrass and the weeds and leftover vegetables in a plot and eat them, convert them into, <coughs> excuse me, eggs and fertilizer. And once I move them off of there, it's very easy to prepare that plot. The manure, the nice thing about chicken manure is uh, that they distribute it very evenly on the ground and as opposed to pigs or cows or horses. Um, the chickens put it in a very thin sheet over the whole thing and so I can uh, chisel plow some beds and lightly rototill them to prepare the seed bed and boom, we're ready to go and just shallowly cultivate it to keep down the weeds, move the chickens to the next plot that's grown up with weeds and so I'll just cultivate lightly and mulch the the plants and then once they get mature enough and they can't get in there and weed them and the weeds are growing up, and then it's about time for the chickens to move back in. So they move back in and, and take everything back down to the dirt again and it's uh, enabled me to be able to handle about a garden, uh, acres worth of garden um, by myself for the most part, um, whereas before it just, it was a lot of labor trying to hand apply compost and um, I didn't like always tilling the grass because it just tended to destroy the soil structure. We have real heavy clay soil here and with the chickens, when they get rid of most of the weeds, then we don't have near as much problem with um, Having to, we don't have to till near as much, and there's been lots of more earthworms. Uh, the soil structure has been a lot better, and it's really neat because they, they scratch in all the organic matter from all the weeds that that were there. Um, they tromp down, and the soil has just just really been enriched. And the nice thing about it is that they're doing the work, and uh, and I have had to do a whole lot less just move them around. In fact, I've got to got to move them in the morning to a new plot, clean up some old tomato plants. But the neat thing is that they're able to take what would otherwise be a liability on the farm, the, the weeds, and turn them into assets, fertilizer and eggs, which we're able to sell. So we have vegetables that we produce. Um, we sell them. We've done some CSA shares, community-supported agriculture shares, selling bags, subs subscriptions, where people receive... <coughs> 
weekly bags of produce. We've done that primarily in our own uh, neighborhood on our own road here and might be expanding that next year. We also sell at the farmer's market and to restaurants and local privately owned stores uh, in, in the Birmingham area in Alabama. But here's some squash, and it's amazing the difference the, the chickens make. Uh, I wish I had thought to put some pictures on here. I had some contrasts last year, last fall, where it had where the chickens had been and where the chickens had not been. It had broccoli plants that, that some of them were about four inches tall and some of them were about eight to ten inches tall, and they were the same age. But one was planted where the chickens had been and one was planted where they had not been even though compost had been applied there earlier in the year. And uh, it just, it's, it's really amazing how, how much that nutrient in, impacts the plants. And I tend to plant the garden in, uh, I guess because of the way the chickens work, whenever the chickens move and I have a plot that's, uh, available, I tend to plant whatever is in season at that point, whatever I can plant at that point in the season. So I don't typically have <coughs> all my tomato a tomato plot that I plant several plantings of tomatoes in, but I tend to have, you know, I plant this plot with squash and beans and tomatoes, and then the next plot beside them, I'll plant squash and beans and tomatoes again. So it keeps a little bit more diversity in the garden. You kind of have to be careful of your rotation, but it keeps there from being a bunch of tomato plants where the hornworms can just, just have a heyday and the breaking up tends to kind of confuse the pests and work out a lot better. Here we have uh, our pasture. We have our first, since everything was trees, we've had to clear most everything that we uh, that we want to have open land, which is nice. I, the trees are a great resource and I don't have to mow them <laughs> when I'm not using them, but uh, it does take a little bit to, to clear it. This particular pasture we had bulldozed and I left that strip of trees down the middle you can see in the background for some diversity and for shade and to prevent erosion on this hillside because we're in pretty hilly country here um, in the Piedmont area of Alabama. But uh, here we have our milk cow we got last year. So we just have her for ourselves. And uh, we weaned the calf a few weeks ago, and she's given us a lot of milk. It's a real blessing to actually have all the milk you want to make cheese and butter with and um, we actually I brought in the milk from the milking last tonight and my sister said that uh, <laughs> we don't have any more jars so I'm going to have to eat some of the chickens or take some to some neighbors but uh, here we have the chickens in with the milk cow trying to they scratch through all the cow patties and help keep down the flies and uh, kind of sanitate the pasture we now have a couple of mules in the pasture as well that uh, picked up last week. I'm going to try to get them trained for uh, doing some draft work for us. Here we have smaller plots of, of garden and fields that we work that it's a little harder to get in with a tractor for cultivating. So we're really going to try to have that next project going, figure out how to use draft animals. But is our uh, our first pasture here. It's been very nice. The grass looks really well, really nice right here. We also have those same four pens right there have broiler chickens in them. At this at this very moment, we're going to be processing them or rolling in the uh, in next month. So we have the portable shelters made out of cattle panels or um, hog panels that are. <coughs> excuse me. There's a two to four frame on the ground and. Three panels bent over with ends framed up and a tarp thrown over it from chicken wire. And I'll keep them in there when they're young and then let the chickens roam out when they get a little bit older. And uh, Except now I'm going to have to put some electric netting around them because the cows and the mules like the chicken feed, so they'll start robbing the pens if, if I let them get in there close to it. We raise about 400 in the spring and in the fall, and we butcher them before and after the season, the farmer's market season. Our farmer's market begins in May and goes through October. We process um, 
normally Friday night is what we've been doing lately. Um, I think it's on the next, there's a picture of that on the next slide. And uh, process after it gets dark on Friday night and then have the chickens in ice water overnight and, and the customers come the next morning and pick them up. So we have a shed with some concrete floor and uh, definitely did not start off this nice. <laughs> we were tuning it in the grass without any type of roof. But we've gotten to where we can do, we do 200 birds in one in, in a night, and uh, that's about all the cooler space we have to chill them. Um, but we have a great time. We have music playing and um, try to make kind of a fun time of it when we have our disassembly line going. Uh, most of my, uh, most of our, my siblings and people that, uh, that help with the processing are more night people, night owls, so it's been a lot more fun since we've been doing it at night as opposed to in the morning. Here's one of my brothers. They are awesome chicken catchers. They keep the killing cones full for us, and really, they're the ones that sped us up the most because we don't have to wait for chickens to die anymore because they keep them coming really fast, and they have races to see who <laughs> <coughs> can load up their chickens and the fastest. And, uh, they do a really good job. They're great troopers. So here's my young son, Enoch. Loves to come with me to do the chores. He uh, loves animals. He is such an animal lover. And loves the chickens and um, can't really get down to do anything with them yet. The other day I was over at the broilers and he's big enough now he can sit in the seat without a, a bumbo there, a bumbo seat, and put a little broiler chick up next to him and he was looking at it and talking to it and, and touching it. But it's one of the great things I like about farming is the ability to, you know, just include my family in my work, which is not something that every job allows. And, uh, of course, I have to, you have to be purposeful to, to make sure it's family-friendly because you can also just be a farm workaholic. Um, but it does definitely provide a great opportunity for being able to to integrate, you know, family life and work life together. And this is our that's our faithful golf cart too. There's a lot of miles on it. <laughs> our farm, because it's a lot hillier here, is uh, our, it's kind of spread out. It's not as close together as I'd like because we kind of had to work with the terrain. So the gardens down below the houses and the chickens are on the other side of the farm and everything kind of moves around so it takes a little bit sometimes to do the chores going from, uh, from different spots where the chickens are to, to haul feed and, and do different things but it's, uh, it's interesting. I like it better than just flat land personally. So here's our farmer's market booth we, uh, where we sell. We have our eggs and when we bring baked goods and my mom makes homemade vanilla and uh, then whatever vegetables we have. We also will take orders for our broiler chickens here, and uh, I'll play my fiddle too. I enjoy doing that on Saturdays uh, when we go up there. We only have four more. I'm going to be sad when it's over, four more weekends. But uh, it's people are so supportive there and so encouraging, and, and we get to meet a lot of people and, and hopefully encourage a lot of people as well. So it, it's something that I think at first we, we didn't really want to do farmer's markets, but uh, I think we're going to continue this one at least for the time being because the Lord's blessed it so much. So I guess one question I wanted to address uh, some people, a lot of people have is, is growing food really worth it? Uh, it's definitely hard work, and it's very easy to buy it. It's very cheap. So why should we grow it? And uh, Or you might be that you like farming, um, but is it really worth it to pursue it beyond a hobby? Because farming is something I do more full-time rather than just a side hobby. Um, so is it really worth it to, to do it? Can you make an actual living doing it? There you go. Well, some of the benefits I've found of growing your own food, <laughs> first of all, the lifestyle. 
it's a great opportunity to be able to work with your hands, um, to be able to be out in the dirt and um, get down there help, you get exercise. Quality of food is much better when you um, produce it yourself directly to use fresh. You know exactly what went into it. Um, you, there's food security. It's not having to be shipped somewhere. And, uh, you know, so for me as a father and a provider for my family, it's important to me because I have a responsibility to provide and I don't want to just uh, have to rely on the grocery store uh, to provide food for my family in terms of if there was, uh, you know, even something like a hurricane or, whatever, or tornadoes or whatever that we have our own food stores and are able to produce it ourselves. And one of the cool things about um, growing your own food is that it's self-production, to my knowledge, is the only form of income that isn't taxed anymore. About everything else that you're going to do as far as producing income is going to be taxed, whether you're bartering or anything else. But as far as things that, uh, as far as things that you produce for yourself, there's no money exchange, and uh, so you get to keep basically 100% of what you put into it. And Because uh, when you buy it, you're taxed when you pay for it, they're taxed when they sell it to you, and uh, the price goes up. But um, that's definitely a benefit that I hadn't realized at one point, you know, of, of growing your own food. So I definitely think as far as anybody, it's, it's definitely um, worth it to grow your own food. As far as doing it for a living, you know, a lot of people used to do farming, um, used to be over, you know, two, about 75% or more of, of Americans were involved in agriculture, and now it's 0.05%, I think, of the um, working people of America are, in, are actually farmers, but uh, some of the reasons for the difficulty of, of being profitable today in farming is, first of all, because of government intervention, subsidies, um, mess with the, the free market, and um, when you have grain subsidies, you had the Homestead Act, which was actually a form of a, a subsidy that encouraged farmers to go and, and um, be, plant stuff when there wasn't necessarily a, uh, a need for it and, and encouraged things like the Dust Bowl. But when you have farmers that uh, can grow at a, and sell at a loss and still make a living, still make money because of subsidies, um, it, it makes it difficult if you don't take subsidies to be able to compete with that. Regulations also make it difficult because um, it also makes it difficult to get started because it's not very conducive to small scale and um, are, are geared towards large scale production. So unless you're really large, uh, it's difficult to be able to afford to comply with some of those regulations, especially in the meat industry in terms of processing and, and things like that. Um, the industrial farming model that we have today, the scale, um, makes it difficult to get into, requires a lot of land, a lot of debt, a lot of inputs, and uh, it's just difficult for, for a lot of any people that are interested in making a living doing it to actually get into it and, um, and, and be profitable without just incurring a whole lot of debt and a whole lot of risk. So my experience has been in, in more small-scale family farming. So the question is, can families make a living farming? But I, I mean, can can uh, you be able? Can you provide for the daily necessities that you need um, through the income that you make farming? And the answer is on the next slide. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so first of all, to gain a proper view, you have to realize it is hard to make a living farming. Um, it normally takes more than one generation to uh, 
to start a farm. You can see with Joel Salatin, um, he was multiple generations. For his dad started it, but didn't actually make a living off of it. He paid for it. Um, it's a big project. It's not it doesn't require just a computer and some software to get started. It requires land and and capital and resources um, to be able to even get off the ground. And that's why it's it's very conducive to um, family farming, um, multi generations uh, as far as collaborating together to to get it started. But it may not happen if you're the starting generation. It may not get to the point that um, you're actually able to make a living off of it, maybe your children. And also don't feel like you fail just because you receive off-farm income. You can farm, you know, even I am not opposed to having side businesses while I'm farming. Um, of course, our farming needs to be profitable, but and we shouldn't work to be able to afford the farm uh, or just to pay for our farming. Our farming needs to be profitable, needs to be sustaining itself, but um, we don't want to limit ourselves just to farming. Our, our culture has such a specialist mentality today where we are a farmer or we are a banker. We are, uh, you know, one special, a specialist in one thing, and yet um, historically many farmers were well-rounded and engaged in politics, crafts, and trade. Um, you had, even in the Bible, Abraham and David. Um, historically, you had people like Oliver Cromwell in England was engaged in politics and yet started out as a farmer, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Um, it's, it's a good, it's, farming is very complementary to other pursuits. And regardless of whether it's the only thing that you do, it's a good. It's something. Uh, it provides a good base for um, other businesses, other endeavors, and uh, and again, it's just don't don't consider that if you're going to farm that you have to limit yourself um, to farming exclusively. Let's see if this next slide is. There we go. Here's the question: Can you make a living farming today? And I, I would say it depends on how you live. We're talking, if we want to talk about uh, different lifestyles, we have, you live a consumer lifestyle where the life that you live is primarily unproductive, where you're primarily a consumer, and unless you're, quote, at your job, then you're not uh, being productive. If you have lots of debt, which limits your flexibility, if you're, you know, paying interest on things, you have to buy everything that you use, which means you're paying retail prices and you owe lots of taxes, then it is very difficult to um, to make a living farming off the income that it that you can receive, especially with uh, small scale and when you're first starting out. But if you live more of a producer lifestyle, where your life is productive, where your your household is not one of just consumption, but is uh, where you're 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 saving, you're putting up, you're canning <coughs> your you're making things where uh, you have little to no debt. You're creative about um, starting very small and working your way up. Not, you know, especially if you're like me, getting started. You're living in a small shop um, and, and saving up and being able to build a house. Um, if you're producing much of your own needs, then again, it's primarily self-production is is your cost plus your labor and you owe a few taxes. <clears throat> so on our farm here, my my monetary salary is would probably not be sufficient to provide for a family if I had to buy everything that else that I needed. But my monetary salary, in addition to all the food that I receive, as well as being able to live here and and work here and the, the exercise that I get and the ability to spend time with my family and the recreation we have here, and all those things that most people have to go somewhere and pay um, to be able to, to have, I'm able to uh, receive from the farm as well. And in doing that, then the money that we, that we make off the farm is more than enough <coughs> to be able to, to provide for the monetary needs that we have and uh, you know, our, our utilities and our car and um, health 
health insur- insurance stuff and uh, and things like that. But again, if we were buying all that, then it would be very difficult um, to get started, especially um, where you're having to you know, put in a lot of work and um, as your farm is growing. But if you are living a producer lifestyle, uh, definitely is. Two types of entrepreneurism when we're viewing and evaluating farming in terms of its um, whether it's successful as a business or not. Um, financial entrepreneurship is the way most of us look at businesses where money is the primary goal of the business. You know, how much money is it successful? Well, we look at at the bottom line. Um, primary reason we start them is to is we hope to use the money to be able to afford the lifestyle we desire. Um, we start the business and again our our goal is to be able to afford to live the way that we we desire. The lifestyle of a business is primarily evaluated in terms of the interference with the desired lifestyle. You know, if you want to be at home most uh, a lot of time and you want to be able to afford to be with your family, then, you know, obviously you would, the lifestyle of the business, if you travel a lot, then you wouldn't want it. But um, again, the lifestyle is not necessarily the goal. Profit is primarily the goal of that type of business. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, perfectly legitimate with, with most businesses. But we can also evaluate a business from a lifestyle entrepreneurship point of view where the lifestyle of the business is the primary goal. Um, and we hope to be, where we start the business and evaluate its success um, based on the lifestyle that we are able to have because of it. Um, having a productive lifestyle and making a living. It's not just that it, it's something that's a whole, but where it may not be making enough, you know, making us wealthy, but we're able to pay the bills and we can live the type of lifestyle that that we intend. And if you evaluate agriculture and most farming in terms of uh, the lifestyle that it provides, then it's very successful in my opinion. If you evaluate it from the financial entrepreneurship point of view, many times it's like, why in the world would you do that when you could be (laughs) doing something else and making a lot more money for a whole lot less time? (laughs) <laughs> so here we have the, uh, you know, what I would call agribusiness versus agri lifestyle. Um, most agriculture today tends to be more uh, successes viewed in terms of money, yield, profit and yield drive most decisions, and as a result, they tend to be debt-based, large-scale, centralized, and corporate. But um, the type of life, agriculture that I, I tend to be um, favorable towards or, or attracted to myself is more of an agri-lifestyle where I view the success of my farm primarily in terms of it, the lifestyle that I receive from it um, in terms of ministry and, and spending time with my family and working with my hands and making the land productive. Decisions are made based on lifestyle and uh, tends to be debt-free, small-scale, decentralized, and family-run um, so that's, that's kind of how I view my farm. Um, also, in, a, I found an agrarian lifestyle is well suited to family economics like we talked about. Um, and there are different... Um, Things that I've read that talk about even how um, the well, it's just this one these historians that even thought that uh, family uh, the type of the family unit was a result of agrarian lifestyle um, historically, and that the morals of the family um, came from the the growing of food, and, and in my opinion, it's I believe that more the uh, the way the family, the God set set the family up, um, that an agrarian lifestyle. He designed that also to fit well with what he gave us to do, and how he how he uh, intended us to have relationships with one another, and uh, probably more than any business that I've seen, um, or I guess. Is that have experienced with some of the other businesses I've had. Um, farming can be very family friendly, but you have to 
again, it just provides the opportunity. It doesn't happen by default. It can also be very family unfriendly if you don't take advantage of it. But the fact that family, that different generations can work together, be productive, is uh, is definitely beneficial there in terms of the family. In order to provide for us, our farms must be profitable. Just a few things here. Things that lead to profit, we need to be good at planning, working hard, also being generous to um, things that lead to poverty, hate, laziness, stinginess. Um, these are just attitudes and, and uh, mindsets of management that we need to have. Personally, in terms of uh, things I've learned in terms of being profitable food producer, selling retail, obviously you, you get more of the uh, the retail dollar. If you sell retail, you have to produce a whole lot more to be able to make money selling wholesale. Produce first for yourself because <coughs> the more you can produce for yourself, the less you have to, uh, to, to make to be able to provide for yourself. Um, try to focus on less capital intensive, more labor intensive things, especially when you're starting out. Um, a lot of times we can save a lot of money by just spending a couple of days doing something by hand um, rather than investing in expensive machinery that then is going to force us to up our scale. And, uh, you know, for example, things like washing eggs or, you know, harvesting or things like that, we can just get a bunch of, you know, family together or even a few neighbors and um, get it done a lot, you know, in, without having to invest in a lot of expensive equipment. Having multiple customers and products, the more customers you can have, um, the more secure your market is. The more products you have, the more you can sell to each customer. Um, did a little kind of hypothetical study there. The real cost of $1,000 worth of vegetables, if you take into account that you have to earn probably around $1,400 to be able to have $1,000 worth, worth of money left over after taxes, um, and then consider that for about $120, you could probably grow the equivalent of about $1,000 worth of food. You can save, um, you know, over $1,000 by growing $1,000 worth of vegetables rather than purchasing it from the store. Tips for getting started. Establish a vision. Know where you're going. Um, try to establish a direction for your farm. Kind of can I envision it 5, 10, 15 years down the road and, and try to base your decisions upon that. Start with what you have. Um, if you're not doing something with what you have right now, then you're probably not going to be doing a good job once you have more. Uh, expand as your skills, resources, and markets increase, preferably with no debt. Uh, a lot of times you go into debt. Um, if you don't have the resources yet to do something, then you might you probably don't have the, the knowledge or the skills um, even the markets to be able to sustain those. We learn to evaluate new ideas. We always want to be learning, and uh, yet there's a lot of ideas out there. Some of them are good, some of them are not, and we want to be able to be prudent in, in evaluating those. We want to be evaluating them and trying to implement them on our farms. Um, as a young man, it's a, few, a little advice for other young men, um, don't just judge your success according to worldly standards. The world will uh, will tell you what success looks like, and uh, and yet money is not everything, and uh, just having fun and being entertained is not everything. Working hard and being with your family and serving the Lord is is um, it's uh, it's success is dependent upon your goals. Make sure you have the right goals. Make sure your motives are right. Don't just do it for selfish reasons. You get into farming, think it's going to be just all fun and easy and everything, then, then, uh, and you're doing it selfishly instead of to serve others, then you're going to be disenchanted with it very quickly. So in season, make sure you develop your skills when you're young. Um, don't wait just till you're older. Be faithful and little. <coughs> if you want to have animals one day and aren't taking care of the dog that you have right now, then um, you're not going to do a very good job once you once you want to get started. Um, one thing I try to do is find, and even today I still do, try to find farmers that um, farm like know things that I want to know and uh, try to work with and learn from them. 
There's a lot of wisdom out there with uh, older farmers. Be very humble. Be willing to listen. Don't um, be, you know, be quick to listen and slow to speak when you're learning from people. And uh, when we're young, we think we know a lot of stuff, but we really don't. We have a lot to learn. Be willing to start out at the bottom. When you're getting started, don't think that you have to have it all to get started. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay, there I am. All right, and be creative. There's a lot of uh, different ways to get started. I have a friend just uh, this past weekend that um, got hooked up with another family at our church, had 20 acres that they wanted somebody to do something with, and they wanted a farm, so they've been getting together. And, uh, and normally you have more resources at hand than you think. And uh, Just be creative and get started. Don't, don't think it's going to be handed to you. If you get go. Right. And you can do it. As far as uh, food production, it's worth it, in my opinion. Um, the lifestyle, the the um you know, the profit, everything it's 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 way worth it. It's enjoyable and it's definitely doable. If you're humble and willing to learn and, and start small. It's not rocket science. They're very forgiving. And I encourage you, if you're if you're not already, to go home and grow food. And uh, good tips for getting started: study food production, get a lot of books and read, grow a few vegetables, work on enriching your soil. Uh, good good thing to start off with is some chickens. And uh, if you have a family, try to work hard together, doing it and. Uh, and enjoying and learning together. So that's my uh, that's my encouragement to you tonight. Well, thank you so much, Noah, for giving us your insights and telling your story. It's very encouraging to see how uh, God has worked in your family, uh, in through your parents, and then and then you as the next generation uh, getting a, a farm started, you know, clearing the frontier, so to speak, and exciting to see how he continues to work uh, through your story and others uh, like you as a result of the inspiration you've, you've given. Um, before we get into questions, I just want to go over a couple of things here. Uh, I would encourage you to follow um, Noah's uh, journey as he continues. Uh, his blog is redeemingthedirt.com, and um, he shares uh, you know, updates on what they're doing on the farm and interesting insights about uh, things that he's thinking about uh, often we'll talk about um, news or trends and uh, how that relates to small-scale family farming. Um, and the book website is bornagaindirt.com. You, uh, I would highly recommend that you get uh, the book. Uh, one of the quotes from uh, the Amazon reviews, a guy named Kyle said, I think this is the most important book on farming and agriculture, second to scripture, that a Christian can have in his or her library. Even if you don't have control over any land whatsoever, this is a must read. And I think that really uh, kind of uh, is, is common among the, the reviews that I've read and, and heard, which is that even if you're not farming per se, that uh, this is a really fantastic resource to uh, see what the Bible says about agriculture and the way that we treat and, and think about food. And, uh, it, and just as a result of... of um, Noah going to the scriptures and, and putting that into practical application through his family. Uh, he has a lot of, of wisdom to share. And particularly, I think, just in terms of he, he's gone through this process of kind of going back to the land. And uh, it's great to, um, uh, to, to learn from what he's learned. And uh, the book is a, is a really good organized uh, resource for how to, how to approach a lot of those issues. Um, I encourage you, we, you can get the book uh, on the book website, uh, on the True Food Solutions store. And I'd, I'd encourage you, if you have read the book or if you get the book, to go on Amazon and please leave a review there uh, and, and tell others about it because it's great to get the word out and, and share about what a great resource this is. Uh, I want to mention a special offer we're doing. Um, last week with Renee's uh, book, we did a 20% uh, off um, discount, which we're going to extend this week. Uh, I want to, um, because I didn't get it out until late in the week, I wanted to, to give some extra time for people that want to take advantage of it. Um, in addition to the 20% off your order, 
uh, you can get um, for any orders over fifty dollars, you can get a free ebook, either um, Renee's study guide or the digital copy of Noah's book. And um, it, you can use code Generations uh, or Born Again if uh, you want to get that twenty percent off. And then, depending on which one you use, will indicate which which free ebook you you want to receive if you're going to order over fifty dollars. So. Um, you can. Uh, we'll send out an email with that information as well, so you don't have to necessarily copy it down now. But if you are interested, you can get that on the uh, on the True Food Solutions store. And uh, just in case anybody was wondering, if you've had any issues getting onto the website in the past week or two, we were doing a, a server migration and had some issues, but they should all be fixed now. If you have any problems, just let us know, and we'll be sure to look into them and see if there's any lingering uh, problems that need to be fixed. Um, last point before we get to the Q&A, uh, next week uh, we're excited to have Kristen Canty uh, on with us. She's the producer of the documentary Farmageddon, which is a really important film if you have not seen it already, talking about uh, really the, the assault on family farming and small-scale agriculture in America by both state and federal um, regulators. And it's kind of an eye-popping, eye-opening expose into the whole issue. And um, if, you, if you are already um, a small far, uh, farming advocate and a, uh, a customer of local farms. Uh, this will, will steal your resolve for what you're doing. And if you're not already, it probably is going to give you some, um, uh, some insight and uh, incentive to do so. Uh, so we look forward next week to having uh, Kristen on. She'll have a lot of great info to share. So I just want to give everybody a heads up on that. Um, so now we're going to go to questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box, and we will um, uh, take them as they come. Um, we have had a couple questions already, Noah, that uh, came in, which I'll hit uh, real quick here before the rest of them come in. Um, somebody was asking when you were talking about eggs. Somebody asked um, if you uh, wash your eggs, you just wipe them off, um, and if you could. Uh, give us the reason why you do one or the other, uh, what the benefit is or the, the principle is involved in that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, at least from what I've read and always heard, the eggs, when they are laid, they have a you know, protective coat to protect them, the inside of the egg from bacteria. Um, and so we, we want to preserve that as much as possible. So we don't wash the eggs. Um, we've well, in, unless they're really dirty, we what we normally do is we bring the baskets in, and then we have a small, you know, wet washcloth. And if it's clean, then we don't do anything to it. If it has a smudge on it, then we'll wipe the smudge. Um, and if they're just really dirty, then we'll wash them and normally keep those for ourselves. We eat most of the cracked and, and dirty ones <laughs> in our, our own family. Do you have any? Uh do you have any tips on how to um, you know, keep the eggs as, as clean as possible in terms of how you manage your nesting boxes and that kind of thing? Yeah, well, you know, just fresh bedding is one of the keys. In, in my portable coops that I have, which are old cotton wagons, I took the floors out, most of the floors out of them and put down wire mesh so the floors stay clean in there and uh, try to keep the, the nesting boxes with uh, with fresh chips, if there gets an egg broken or whatever, then I'll you know take out those chips and, and put in some new ones on top. And uh, also keeping them moved. If it gets muddy where they are, then you know <laughs> my my wife and and uh, when she cleans the eggs and stuff, she'll say I can tell it rained because <laughs> when it rains they're definitely dirtier. But if you have them on, if you're able to have, you know, our farm is just developing, so we have had dirt. You know, here and there, lots of places. And as the grass gets better, then we have less problems with that because they're not don't, not in the mud. Great. Um, when you were uh, the one slide you talked about bees, somebody asked if you have a good beekeeping resource to uh, to to mention or or maybe some tips on getting started with bees. Yeah, I was actually reading it this afternoon. Um, the Practical Beekeeper, I think that's what it's called. It's a new one that came out um, by Michael Bush. And I haven't read the whole thing, but it's, it's one of the best ones I've seen as far as he takes a very natural approach to be beekeeping. Um, a lot of the traditional books, <coughs> as well as the people that got me started, the man that got me started, you know, is very much 
you know, treating with chemicals and, and kind of trying to force him to do what you want him to do. And his approach, Michael Bush's, is a little more, um, you know, just kind of documents of his research, private research on uh, trying to work more with the way God designed bees and uh, has a lot of neat tips from the things that I've read. And, and uh, bees, bees are the one of the next enterprises on our farm that we're going to um, – Increase because the, the neat thing about honey, I'm trying to I'm trying to focus on products on my farm that, uh, that have shelf life because it it makes your marketing flexible and uh, you know if you have honey you can sell it all year long if you have maybe something like dried garlic that's great if you can you know grow grains and sell grits or um, you know things like that it it just expands the possibilities of your of your, you, know, you, you can market in the winter time and uh, things that are. If you focus on, we're trying to specialize maybe in like things that have long shelf life and then things that are super fresh because you know the super fresh stuff you have a niche market because it's hard for large scale producers to compete with you um, on the super fresh stuff and then having the uh, having the the shelf life stuff that I don't have to focus on. If I don't sell it today, then it's going to be bad by tomorrow type thing. Mm. That's a great insight. Um, I know that uh, we a few weeks ago when we had the Roberts brothers on and they're doing market gardening, um, we talked a bit about um, Elliot Coleman, who uh, you know yeah. is kind of the the expert on on um, cold weather gardening. And he it's kind of interesting because he you know he lives in Maine, but he he actually does the majority of his production during the winter. So he, right. he actually tries to do kind of what you're talking about, which is the um, very fresh uh, produce but off-season so that uh, you kind of capture that niche market. It's hard to, to for other people to compete if they're not uh, doing that. But the, uh, the approach you mentioned I think is great, which is things that have longer um, shelf life, uh, which allows you to extend the season essentially. So things like, um, like honey or... Um, you know, potentially I think things that that store well, uh, root crops or um, winter squash or something. If you can preserve them well, actually, if you have a root cellar or something, you might be able to um, to extend it that way too. So that's a great insight. That uh, you know, some people may, may not necessarily think uh, timing in terms of of that kind of a of an approach. So it's uh, very helpful, I think. Well, I have I know one family that they do CSA year round because they have root crops and storage crops that they, mm -hmm. you know, provide weekly to people. Right. That's great. Someone else asked about laying uh, hens, uh, or I guess in general with chickens, and uh, the question is, uh, do you think it's important to feed organic chicken feed, and uh, why or why not? I think it's important to feed them the best feed that you possibly can. I can't um, get a very economical source of organic chicken feed, certified organic. Um, the feed that I get is ground locally by a local mill. Um, the guy does is close to Joel South and his recipe is on it. He uses Fertrol Culture Nutri Balancer and um, but I don't think it it's not it's still GMO grains because um, just there's very few people first of all we're not in a grain part of the state of the country so you know it's we're shipping a lot of stuff in and uh, so he, the, the guy that produces the feed, also raises natural eggs, and we just we've continued to scratch our heads on it. But you know, I've just said we're, we're on my farm. We're trying to begin to develop um, clear land where we can start to grow our own feed for the chickens. But I say get the best feed that you possibly can. And, and the Lord, I think, understands that you know, just because you can't be perfect today in terms of the way that you farm um, doesn't mean that you don't do it. You know, just you got to start where you can and you want to always be improving as much as you possibly can. But, um, you know, the feed that I feed them last year because it's, the price has gone up so much, um, I went to another feed that had <coughs> similar ingredients but still it was more of a, you know, commercial feed, still, still made locally around here. Um, had more byproducts in it, so it was a little cheaper. But the quality of the eggs went down significantly just from the feed, even though I had them on grass and everything else. And um, 
So I swapped right back to our, our other more expensive, high-quality feed. And uh, just week after week at the farmer's market, we have people come up and just say, you're the, your eggs are the best eggs we've ever had. Or, you know, your eggs are better than anybody else's at the farmer's market. Or, you know, I, I bought your eggs, and then I went and got some at the grocery store, and my husband said, Dad, these are bad. You know, go back and get those other ones. So it's neat, you know, when you do the best you can, I think the Lord blesses it. And we've had, you know, we've gained a really, you know, good reputation for the eggs that we produce. And I think a good big part of that is feeding the best you can. If you can get organic feed, I'd recommend it. Um, I just can't economically purchase it without charging $8 or $9 a dozen for eggs <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that, it is it is, uh, it is difficult to find uh, good sources of feed. I think that, uh, and, I, and I actually last year started doing um, pastured uh, poultry, and we were fortunate enough to have uh, a place uh, that actually did probably the best feed I've seen or, or found. It's organic um, up in the Shenandoah Valley, so we had a little bit of a, you know, we only get a, a supply run. They'd bring it down to near us uh, once a month, so we had to, you know, yeah. stay on top of planting and all that kind of stuff. A lot of people don't have that, and I think that um, what you were mentioning about a local mill, um, that's kind of the same thing that we have closer to where we're at, uh, and what I have another friend of mine who's doing it is by basically doing that as well. But, you know, I think uh, over time, people that are interested in doing, um, you know, growing their farms and that kind of thing uh, and, you know, trying to get better feed, uh, I think it helps to, to reach out and get to know people in your, your area, other farmers that are interested in doing the same thing, and maybe get together. And um, a lot of these, these local mills will actually do custom batches if they're big enough, like the one that's near us will do, uh, if it's anything over a ton, they'll mix a ton at a time, a custom blend. But you know right. you have to provide the input. So then the challenge is finding uh, organic grain farmers, right, to to provide that. But right. if you can if you can work uh, collaboratively to provide the inputs, either by sourcing or by growing it yourself, um, then that may may meet the need. And I think that really going forward, that's where a lot of the challenges uh, for small producers are going to get get uh, solved is through collaboration among small producers and trying to get, in particular, this challenge of, of trying to, for animal feed and trying to get it, uh, you know, organic, not necessarily certified organic, but at least in the approach of raising it so they can get away from the pesticides and especially the GMO uh, right. uh, varieties, well, that's, that's, it's hard to do. Yeah, well, I, I talked to one farmer um, that was growing corn. I was like, well, can you grow us some, you know, non-GMO? He's like, sure, sure, yeah, we have, uh, have lots of other corn chemicals I can spray on non-GMO crops. I was like, okay, so he's going to grow his non-GMO corn, but he's going to spray with more chemicals to be able to grow that crop. So I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think also viewing it as not just a input system, but trying to design, incorporate our chickens into our farm where they're utilizing byproducts. You know, we're growing seed for them. You know, we grow <laughs> a crop, <coughs> excuse me, and then we move the chickens on it and let them eat it. Um, if I got down to a smaller number of chickens or, you know, once my farm gets to a point, I, I can't, then I would be able to incorporate them in where, again, I'm not just viewing it as a, I had to buy feed, but the chickens are, you know, chickens and pigs are the the um, the scavengers. They're the, the recyclers. They're, mm -hmm. They take all, everything that you can't use and they turn it into a useful product. And we need to utilize that rather than just you know, saying, oh, my word, you know, it costs so much to feed them, say, no, that's great. You know, we can we can feed them waste or something like that. So I think that approach, too, is going to have to be um, evaluated in order to be economical because I'm paying $15 a bag right now for layer feed, which I feed 100 pounds a day um, to my chickens, and that's not that's not organic. And, and the guy that I'm buying it from is, is trying to move towards you know, developing an organic feed because the demand is so high, but it's going to be a lot more than that for him to make it. So right. I just had to go up on my egg prices, you know, and I just, it's just, it's a hard, hard to know how to, how to deal with it because I want to supply affordable quality eggs for people. But if I go, you know, too pure, too fast, then I'm not going to be doing better a favor because they can't afford them, you know. Right. Yeah, our, our experience was that the uh, the organic feed was over twice the cost of the conventional feed. 
So uh, you, it uh, and and that was you know before the the this this current season's drought. Um, so depending on where you live, like it didn't really affect us in the east. But if you were in an area that was, that was drought, I mean, you know, feed costs are going through the roof. So um, even for conventional stuff. So it's uh, I, I think that what you mentioned, Noah, is actually a really good point too. I didn't mean to avoid that and just talk about you know input. And but the fact is that um, most people that are getting started or doing small scale either don't have the ability immediately or haven't gotten to a more holistic way of thinking about the farm to do to do what you're talking about doing, which is really trying to um, to to self source as much feed on the farm as possible, and that includes uh, how you how you use the animals uh, with respect to not just the pasture they might be on, but even like you do with the garden and other things. I think that's real important to do as well, um, and it is a little easier when you're when you're very small scale if you're doing a lot more production commercially, um, obviously that becomes uh, a little more challenging to do and, and right. you need off And that's why I still buy it. Yeah, that's why I still buy it. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, that's great. Well, if you, if you have, uh, if you, you know, get some, some more advancement on um, finding ways to produce feed on farm, we'd love to hear about that on your blog and, uh, you know, share what you're learning. I know this is a particular area of, of interest for a lot of people because a lot of people get started with started with chicken, so I think it's a, a important part to kind of share what we're what we're learning, what we know. Um, I had a question. Somebody asked about um, you know kind of learning how to farm, being interested in farming, and uh, I know there's a lot of farms out there that have apprentices. Um, somebody asked a question of whether you know of any farms or heard of any farms that do apprentice apprenticeships with entire families. And um, do you, are you aware of that, Noah? Have you ever heard of that? Not recently. Um, <coughs> I haven't. It's something that that possibly in the future we'd like to be able to offer, but I don't know of anybody hmm. right now that's uh, that's offering that. Yeah, I I know that from some from uh, friends of mine. I have one friend um, who. Uh, has had apprentices, and uh, I think that they, you know, it depends on the circumstance. Both the the farmer themselves, what their family circumstance is, what kind of infrastructure they have, as far as if there's there a place for the for the family for a farming family that's apprenticing to live, the term of it, everything else. I think it, it's definitely possible, but it would depend on the circumstance. So, um, I think that your approach, uh, you know, in terms of getting uh, interested in looking ahead when you're young is important because you know your family had a great way of going about it, um, kind of going back to the land. But a lot of people uh, take advantage of these apprenticeship programs which are really good to gain skills. Uh, and if you're in the case of uh, you know like Joel Salton's farm, they lease lots of other farms, and a lot of the apprentices will apprentice on the main farm, and then after that they'll go and manage one of the leased farms. For a while, which allows them to right. even further develop their skills um, until they move on to something else. But you know, ultimately, I think the challenge is really, uh, you know, acquiring the land, and which is a capital-intensive thing for most people. So, um, well, if I was getting if I was getting started, I would highly recommend at least I would not buy land um, to start when I was starting out. Um, I would highly recommend renting land um, because. When you don't know quite what you're doing yet, um, it uh, you don't want to invest yourself in a piece of property that you know a couple of years down the road you realize is not the type of land that you even want for what you're doing. Um, that you know you're able to get some some years under your belt with uh, with with learning some things to even know what you want. You know if you're looking for land to invest in long term and you don't even know what you're looking for, you know, because you haven't ever done it before, then um you know right now there's there's lots of <coughs> opportunities for land management because <coughs> a lot of people that own land, you know, are getting older or don't have the time to do it. Um I, I have m multiple people now that are you know, I have, I have people come up to me and say, I have land. You know, do you know of anybody that could utilize it? 
you know, multiple people come up to me and ask me that, and I've been able to hook some of them up with people that don't have land that are looking just to manage some and to start a farm. And that's, I think, there was this one guy, um, I saw his testimony on a blog, and he put an ad on Craigslist for some land, kind of gave his description of what he wanted to do and what type of person he was and everything. And I think within two weeks, he had 35 responses with people wanting to, to allow, you know, for him to come and work their land and farm it. So there's lots of opportunities out there if you're willing to work and willing to do it to, um, you know, if, that, if that's what the Lord has for you, then most of the time you'll have to be turning down people that want to give you resources if you'll just go with, you know, run with it. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a, a very excellent point. Um, the biggest barrier for most people is just the... Uh, the access, which most people think of in terms of acquisition, i.e., buying a farm, but you're right that um, you know you can uh, start farming and get experience farming if you think outside that box and look for opportunities to put into use, um, you know, farmland that's not being used uh, currently. And I think it's a great, great anecdote of. Uh, within weeks, getting you know dozens of of uh, re- response responses to an inquiry about uh, leasing farmland for uh, for small scale agriculture, and I, I think that just the demographics uh, de- demand that essentially. You know, the the Joe Salzman talks about the average age of the American farmer is up in the 60s now, and we just know that um, culturally speaking, most of the the following generations of those farmers have gone off the farm and don't plan to return. So uh, something has to happen. Um, and, and this is, I think, a particular reason why it's very important that we uh, look at the opportunities to to farm that land, because what will likely happen if somebody doesn't t- put it into small-scale production is it's probably going to get leased um, by an industrial uh, uh, methodology farmer, and they're going to be growing corn or soy on it. And it's mm-hmm. going to just it's going to basically get gobbled up into the agribusiness conglomerate system, rather than um, helping to fuel this uh, this reformation of the farming system back to a sustainable small scale local based system. So um, you know it's probably something we should probably discuss some more. Uh, and I think it'd be great to have a discussion about that on True Food Solutions website and the farming group is you know uh, sharing stories about how people have done that. And uh, what good resources are out there for doing that? And, uh, even even to the point of how do you um, how do you work out the terms of, of one of those agreements? Um, you know, how, what does yeah. it look like? Because yeah. that's uh, mm-hmm. if you don't if you haven't done it before, you know, how do you know how to do it and protect yourself and protect the farmer, uh, the the landowner, right. all those kind of things. Right. So, um, Charles asked a question. Charles from Tennessee asked um, if you think there are young men who'd be willing to apprentice on a family farm. And uh, maybe Charles could expand on that question. Uh, I know what my answer is. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> I, th- I think it's a definite yes. yes. Um, it just depends on your situation. I mean, I could have gone. I didn't go in and apprentice on a farm per se because I was so I was too busy with what I already had going on. Um, because I had lots of opportunities with our land and developing a farm. Um, I needed to be doing it um, and, and learning on our, our place. And I went other places and learned, but as far as spending a year like a Joel Salatons or something, that just wasn't didn't work with my situation. But if I didn't have any other opportunity for applying it, you know, or learning, then, you know, I probably would have done that. And mm-hmm. I jumped on an opportunity to go work with somebody on an actual working farm. Uh, but again, it yeah. just depends on, on their goals and their current situation. Right. But I know, I'm pretty sure I know a lot of young men that would would love to do that. Yeah, I I think uh, the the challenge of getting started in farming uh, is is mostly of a uh, experience and judgment development. Uh, the, the learning curve is the hardest thing. In, in most of it, if you, if you don't learn from somebody else. Uh, who's either learned from somebody else or learned it through trial and error, you're going to be the one doing it trial by error. So learn from others' mistakes, uh, the old it's adage. You start small if you're learning by trial and error. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. It's a lot cheaper that way. 
Yeah, I, th I think that the, the, the apprentice approach is very uh, sound in almost all circumstances, and I think that farming in particular it's a very good one because um, you, can, uh, you can learn a lot of really important things uh, through, through somebody else's experience rather than having to make the costly. And sometimes it's, it's not just a, a monetary cost, which there is often monetary cost and the mistakes that are made, but just in terms of the time it takes, especially when you, you learn something one season and maybe the corrective factor that you need to apply, you can't apply till next season, and then maybe right. you don't get the correction right, so then you have to wait till next season. So you're talking a matter of sometimes years to learn the right lesson versus somebody's already gone through that and just learning it right the first time. So uh, I but, highly but I've found that a lot of times I don't even I don't know that I need to uh, until I've done it, I don't realize the significance of the information they give me, so I don't remember it normally. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. reading a, a Pastor Poultry Prophets after you've raised some chickens. It's like, oh, you said it right there, and I still did it. But, you know, you just until you've been there, you don't even have questions. Mm -hmm. And right. so the answers that people give you really aren't that significant. So sometimes it is good to do it. You know, just do it. And, and 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 learn as you go along because it's really hard to know what all questions you need to have, um, right. you know, when you're starting out. But as far as apprenticing with somebody, what I did and what I would recommend most apprentices, um, if if you're doing something short term, especially, <laughs> which I don't have much experience with, you know, people that I kind of have as uh, quote apprentices on my farm don't don't come for extended periods of time, um, and I didn't go for extended periods of time to other people, but even now, as I quote apprentice with older farmers and try to learn from them, I recommend, if at all possible, volunteer your time and work alongside them, because a lot of times what happens is if they have, if they have to pay you, then they have to, you know, put you doing something very low skill in order to utilize your, you know, non-skill and um, and, and, and you don't learn quite as quickly as if you had the luxury of being able to be alongside them as they worked and, you know, learn and ask questions where they're not actually having to make it worth your, you know, the time that they're paying you. And um, I found that that was very beneficial anyways, that um, if I volunteered and went, then I was able to somewhat learn a lot more And uh, in terms of the learning aspect. Now, if you just wanted, you know, to work and things like that, and that's, that's fine, but if you're trying to glean information from them, you know, volunteering and being able to be by them, their side and ask questions about everything they do and uh, is seem to be very beneficial to me as opposed to just going and saying, hey, I want to work for you, and so then they have you out there, you know, mulching plants every day or something like that, you know. Right. Um, but that's just, that's just one thought I have in terms of, uh, especially short term, you want to go learn something from somebody like the beekeeper or a... Um, you know, fruit guy is if it's all possible. Um, when you're a young person, volunteer your time and and express that you'll trade help in return for education, and they're normally more than willing to do that. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's very wise. Uh, you know, most uh, farm apprentices that I'm aware of, uh, de again, depending on the circumstance, but you know, usually there's not much pay involved, if any. Uh, I mean, we're, they're 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 getting paid in experience. And uh, usually, what uh, is provided in terms of uh, uh, some kind of a compensation is usually uh, maybe living arrangements and/or um, right. you know food cover cost. Right. So um, I, I think that you know you, you hit the nail on the head, which is that you're really trying that, that you're trying to get paid in experience, and you're lending some labor in exchange for that. So um, just keep that in mind. That's kind of the point of the apprenticeship, not necessarily to you know. Um, help to offset the opportunity cost of your time by getting some pay, even though it's less than what you might getting paid something else. You're there to learn, so um, you know, focus on that. And I think there's a lot that can be said from learning, not necessarily apprenticeship, but learning from other farmers. For instance, if you have a, a local um, uh, pasture poultry farmer, you know, go and help on, on processing days and learn how to butcher the chickens. Because if you're going to end up doing that someday, you need those skills, and that takes uh, time of not only seeing how it's done, but actually doing it. Um, and so I mentioned before the show that a friend of mine 
who's doing pasture uh, poultry. He's, he's doing his last batch of the year this weekend, so I'm going to be going and helping him, even though I've done it a lot of times. And um, I, I go for to help out and for the fellowship and all that kind of stuff. But that's a fantastic way to learn, is by going and helping, especially where there's high labor requirements and processing animals is always a high labor requirement activity. So um, you know, look for opportunities to do that. I, I'd say is one of, probably one of the best things you can do, even if you're not doing a more formal apprenticeship. Try to uh, you know look for those opportunities. So if it's a if it's a market garden, go try to. Uh, so you talk you know, if you know the Roberts brothers or somebody like them, who's doing market gardening, ask them when they have times where they have they need a, they need help. They need to have a lot of a lot of work to do, and if you can come and help and learn while you're working alongside them, that's a great opportunity to learn without it being kind of a formal apprenticeship. You can still gain a lot of knowledge that way and prepare yourself for down the road when you're you're ready to do something yourself. Right, right. Um, I found a, uh, one recommended resource really quick for the, for the home feeding of chickens, uh, a new book that came out, The Small Scale Poultry Flock by Harvey Ussery or Ussery. Um, on Amazon, but the small scale poultry flock has a forward by Joel Salatin, but he has he's one of the few people I've ever read articles online about um, actually feeding your chickens, producing their own feed, and using them in your gardens and things like that. But for anybody interested in that type of thing, I'd recommend that book. Great. I, th I think I've seen his website before. He's got a lot of great info on there. So thanks for throwing that out. Um, I think I came across that book as well. I'll add that to the list of resources, um, which I'll post on the uh, the page uh, for this webinar, which also have the recording available uh, in the next day or two, also put uh, the, the resources that you mentioned in the, in the talk tonight uh, down there. So if somebody wants to get a copy of those books, they can they can click on those to get to them. All right. Well, I think we're we're about done. I don't know if there's any other. Does anybody else have any other questions they want to ask before we wrap up for the night? Uh, I see there's some discussions in the chat box uh, between attendees about. Um, Kind of backyard chickens, and if you can't have animals, then how, you know what you should you do. And um, I think that uh, I want to try to keep the questions tonight on on you know what your expertise is in, which is is farming uh, in a more rural setting. Um, hopefully, we can get a uh, another session with someone that's experienced with backyard chickens, and particularly with the often the local activist effort that's needed to. Uh, overturn local ordinances that prevent backyard chickens. I think chickens are, are probably one of the most important uh, things that we need to go back to the ancient paths. And really, they're not that ancient. It was just only in the you know, 40s and even 50s when backyard chickens was pretty normal. But uh, you can eliminate a lot of food waste and, and be a lot more productive in our, our households, I think, by going back to chickens. And I, I know you agreed, Noah, and mentioned that in your kind of final uh, steps to getting started, chickens was mentioned. So. Uh, that's always good, I think, to to keep that in mind. All right. Well, nobody else asked any questions. I think we'll wrap it up for the night. No. Do you have any final words you want to share with us? Um, not right now. I just appreciate everybody coming and listening. And uh, I wish I could see everybody face to face. I'm I'm much better when I can uh, <laughs> when I can see people and talk to them. But I uh, enjoyed doing this webinar and uh, hope it was encouraging to y'all. And uh, again, pray that God blesses you and all your efforts to to steward the land. Likewise, Noah. Thank you so much for uh, being on with us tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to write this book and to be a blessing to many uh, in taking uh, wisdom from the Bible and, and from practical application and, and sharing it uh, through this book and through your blog. We look forward to keeping in touch with you in the future. Yeah, thank, and thank you, Jason, for, uh, for all the work you've done on the True Food Solution and for putting on these webinars and uh, everything like that. I, I know it's a blessing to a lot of people. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate it. Look forward to speaking with you sometime soon. All right. That was. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great night.